It is my honor and our privilege to welcome back to Lillington Baptist, Reverend Dudley Neal. Um, I always find you know, John told me, I've, I've seen him speak, and John says he knows um, Dudley personally. And so I guess if you want any good stories about John, you probably need to go talk to this guy. Uh, maybe you can get some good, good scoop on some funny things that John growing up and uh, just some insights on him. But uh, Dudley Neal has served as a pastor and chaplain in the U.S. Army, uh, retired just a few years ago with the rank of colonel. He and his wife have, him and his wife Diane have been married for over 45 years. They have three married sons and nine grandchildren. Anybody got more than nine in here? That's a lot. You may... <laughs> the one. Um, he is currently serving as deacon and the Baptist men's director at Roseboro, for Roseboro First Baptist Church in Roseboro, North Carolina. God's call in his life now is to do and supply preaching and to be involved in missions locally, nationally, and internationally. Church, we please welcome Dr. Dudley Neal. I'm delighted to be in Lillington today. It's like coming home. You know, uh, we uh, lived down in Bun Level for uh, seven years, and, and our family was a part of Lillington Baptist Church. And I say this, we'll never forget your ministry to, to Diane and the children while I was away during Gulf One. Uh, you made them uh, be right at home here. And, and you ministered to them in many ways, and we will never forget you. Um, also, was delighted that um, I could come and supply for John Rogers, uh, who has been a very dear friend since my college days at Campbell and Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. We've been dear friends with John and Joyce. Don't get to see them a lot, but it's like, you know how it is with friends that that really are friends. You just, uh, you don't see them in a while, but when you do, it's like you've always been together. And uh, many of you would be that very same way. We feel, uh, uh, I've greeted several of you uh, in the hallway back and earlier today, and just feel so blessed to be a part of Lillington Baptist Church. We, uh, Diane and I, uh, extremely busy with grandkids. Uh, if it, I don't know how we found time to work. I guess we just didn't have grandkids then. But, uh, last week, uh, Matt, Matthew said, Dad, um, he works in Kinston and his wife works in Clinton and said that the boys, the twins, were in soccer camp. He said, Dad, can you pick them up at 1130 and keep them till we get home? <laughs> So we had a busy week with the twins, Diane and I, and uh, wouldn't take anything for it. Uh, but sometimes we feel exhausted. Anybody, any grandparents here that sometimes they feel exhausted? <clears throat> Thank you, Justin. Um, there he is in the back. Justin introduced me as doctor, but he's used to being at seminary or over at Divinity School. Um, I am not officially a doctor, how about that? That's okay, Justin, it's fine. Um, I know how that is, really. Today is Father's Day. And uh, as I uh, begin my thinking about what I wanted to share with you and what the Lord wanted me to share with you today. I, I had so many memories and so many things that crossed my mind and as I thought about Father's Day, I thought, of course, about my own father. And I thought that my father and grandfather and three great-great-grandfathers are buried in Warren County where I was born and raised. And I thought, you know, I want my boys and I want our grandsons 
to know something about their grandfathers. So I plan in the near future to take my sons, which they've been, but to take my grandsons to the grave of five grandfathers, great, great grandfathers. It's something uh, I feel like I should do to tell them how important and say to them how important Our Father is. I want us to think this morning about the God of our fathers. And this comes directly from the passage of Scripture, well, a couple of passages of Scripture, in the Old and the New Testament. From Exodus, the third chapter, we know this story very well. But the first 15 verses of Exodus 3, and I'm reading from the RSV. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame and a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and lo, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. Moses said, I'll turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called, called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here am I. Then he said, Do not come near. Put off your shoes from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Prejudicites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I'll send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? and bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt. He said, But I will be with you, and this will be a sign for you, that I have sent you. When you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. May God add his richest blessings to the reading and hearing of his holy word as found here in the Old Testament. We give praise and honor and glory to God our Father, his Son Jesus Christ, and his Spirit, the Holy Spirit.
think I've said uh, before when I was here, what I found is the older I get, the drier I get. Maybe it won't be too dry for you, okay. <clears throat> Can God's people pray too much? I want to thank Justin for leading us in prayer. For the people of Emmanuel AMZ, Amy Zion Church in Charleston, South Carolina. I don't know about you, but my heart has been broken for them. And I hurt to the depths of my being. But you know that could happen anywhere. It could happen to us here in Lillington. It could happen in any church across this land. But right now, a service is going on. And that church said it was going to present, proclaim love, grace, peace, and freedom and forgiveness. They've already claimed it. And the reason they can claim it is that because Christ has claimed them. And I ask you this morning, has he claimed you? Would you pray with me a moment? Lord, we pause again. And we pray for brothers and sisters who gather in worship in Charleston, South Carolina. We pray for hurting families and a hurting church family. We even pray, Father, for our enemies and even the attacker. We pray, Father, that for a vision, a vision, Father, that you taught us to be involved in love and grace and forgiveness. I pray you'd help this church family and the people who gather today. And you'd help us as we gather around this word from your word to be strengthened and encouraged and to know, oh God, you are our Father. You made us. You have saved us in Jesus Christ. And you are ever present. Speak, oh God through your word, by the power of your spirit. In this hour we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. This passage from Exodus speaks to us several ways. It speaks to us concerning God and God's eternity. Does it help you to think this morning that there's nothing in all the world that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Does it help you to think about that God planned an eternity that we could live with him forever and ever and ever from the beginning? We're simply passing through this earth. This is not our home. But God has prepared a place for eternity that is our home. 
so someone could snuff out our lives here today. But would it take us out of eternity? No, because it's God's plan for eternity. That if we belong to him, we cannot be taken from him. This passage also suggests of God's unchangeableness. That God is the same today, tomorrow, and forever. He will not change. He made you. He made Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the patriarchs that we read of here in Exodus. And he made each of us. Thanks be to God that God is unchangeable. He loves us conditionally, unconditionally. There is no condition that can take us from God's love. Unconditionally, he loves us. Thanks be to God. It also tells us something about fidelity. About a loyal God. How many times in our lives have we failed? And maybe been unloyal to a loyal God. But he is loyal and there's nothing in all the world that would keep him from being loyal to you. And we ask a question this morning of ourselves. Are we loyal to him? This passage suggests, suggests to us some things concerning the patriarchs. And we know that they were fathers in the faith. And we know that here in this passage, we read there in verse 6, I am the God of your father, the Abraham, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and of Jacob. And we know that the patriarchs served God here on earth. But we also know that they lived above. Because God had picked them out and chosen them and empowered them to be about his business upon the earth. This same passage of scripture, if you'll turn over in Matthew 22, in the New Testament, to verse 32, Matthew 22, verse 32. Words from our Lord himself where Jesus quotes from the Old Testament. He said in verse 31, As for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? We know what God said. We just read it in Exodus. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. So here we find in the first century, our Lord himself, Jesus the Christ, preaching and teaching. He satisfied the Sadducees. And now he's questioned by the Pharisaic lawyer. 
And the Pharisaic lawyer says in verse 36, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And this is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Here is our Lord referring back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then following that, he gives us two of the great commandments, the greatest. And we would have to ask ourselves, are we loving the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind? Are we loving others as we do our own selves? Knowing that these commandments came from our Lord, Jesus the Christ. And who was his father? None other than Almighty God. As we read in Exodus, the I Am. Yahweh, as the mouse said this morning, the church mouse, Yahweh, I Am, our God, had spoken, and our God spoke to Jesus. And Jesus spoke to the people of the first century, people that were following him and commanded them to love with all their heart, mind, and soul. Love their neighbor as thyself. This passage also suggests to us some things concerning ourselves. We are to honor him. We've come here to worship him this morning. We've come here to gather together in fellowship that we might be strengthened to serve him. We've come here to trust him. We've come here to love him. It mentioned, um, Justin mentioned it, and you've heard me mention, the last few years I've been involved in missions by choice because I felt the Lord leading me. In just a few weeks, the 11th of July, I'm going to West Virginia with a team to help a church, a church that needs some refurbishing, a church that needs someone to come and stand beside them, Half of the people in this church are on welfare. We're going because we feel the Lord leading us to go and calling us to go. During the last five years, I've been involved with Baptist men, and now, which has become Baptist on Mission. And of course, Baptist on Mission or Baptist men have been involved in missions around the world a lot locally, disaster relief and many other things involved in missions. But I particular, and I found it quite interesting, and as I read this passage from Exodus, the third chapter, it mentions Mount Horeb, and I want to share, you, share with you a story. I've been going to southern Honduras four out of the last five years to work with our missionaries there in building homes and building Sunday school classrooms on the churches. And about three years ago, Mike and Ginger Green, who were the missionaries, they grew up and were members of a church in Raleigh. But they are there, the missionary coordinators in southern Honduras, and they live in Choloteca, which is one of the 
the largest cities in southern Honduras. It is not very far from the Pacific Ocean. But um, we've been in, involved in helping people who are who need our help. Um, I don't know how many times you've been to the grocery store and picked up a, a cantaloupe or a melon and it said uh, Honduras on it. I've seen the fields where they come from. And I tell you, it's tough. It's, it's back-breaking work. It's in 95-degree heat. It's, um, it's humid. People in southern Honduras who work in the fields get $7.50 a day. Can you imagine And Pepsi costs 55 cents? Seven dollars and 50 cents a day. So you can imagine what they have to live on and to try to make a life. And you can imagine what it means to have someone come in and help you build a church or help you build Sunday school classrooms or to build a home. And We carry and we go and do these things because our Lord has called us to go. The God of our fathers has called us to go and help in the name of Jesus. I was telling a group this morning, I'll never forget the sight of helping this one particular family. It was 10 in the family. And only one in that family we knew that professed Christ and he was a little boy about 11 or 12 years old. And we knew he, he did because he had helped us on some other projects in that community. But we built a house, and a house in Honduras that we build is 19 feet by 25 feet. It's a cement floor, cement block walls, and a metal roof. And with the help of the Honduran people, usually the family and people in the community, we can actually build that house in five days. There are no lights in it. There's no HVAC in it. But it's a home. And it protects them from the elements much better than a thatched house built with mud and sticks. It doesn't have lights in it, but that's OK with them. But they're just thankful. It does have a center pole in that house because they all sleep with the hammocks. And in the walls of the cement block, we put rebar, a hook, so they could hook their hammock at night into the center pole in the house and take it down during the day. But the day that we dedicated the house, we actually washed the people's feet. We felt led to do that. That was quite a moving experience. And then we had a prayer as we all gathered around. And one of the Honduran pastors, as we all placed our hand on the house, prayed the most beautiful prayer, interpreted by our interpreter. And I was telling the group this morning, not a dry eye, every one of those family members I can't tell you whether they became Christians or not because I haven't been back to ask them. I've actually been back in that area, but not really to have contact with them. But why do we do it? Because the God of our fathers has sent us. Today we praise and give thanks. And I encourage you to pledge to live for the God of our fathers and to dedicate your life, and to model your life after the Father God, to our fathers, men. Our families need us in ways that only God has made us. I challenge you today to be the father that God has called you to be, and to be on mission, honoring, trusting, loving, and serving 
our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Would you join with me in prayer? Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, for being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thank you, Father, for being our Father and sending us a Savior in Jesus Christ and being ever present in our life. Challenge us and encourage us today to be about our Father's business of loving, caring, and forgiving. And Father, if there be a person in the sound of my voice here this morning who has never publicly professed faith in Christ Jesus, maybe they need to come and kneel and pray as we stand and sing our closing hymn. Maybe they need to come and profess for the very first time that you are Lord and Savior. Maybe they need to come and just be here at the front and allow you to speak as we sing and pray. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.